first time that we went to this prison, I didn't know anything about Venezuelan prisons. I mean, why would I? <laughs> <laughs> but the first time we went there, there was someone being wheeled out with a sheet over their head. Um, and as they explained to me, as our I'm six- laughing at this yeah. right now, but this is like super uneasy, yeah, this, man. I was like, Whoa, I was like, that's not good. On the 79th episode of Passion and Progress, Emmy winning producer and sports executive, Yaron Descalo. Yaron founded So High Media back in April of 2017. And since then, he has worked on huge projects for NBC, ABC, ESPN, Fox Sports, the Golf Channel. And most recently, he's producing the podcast Sports Wars by Wondery. Previous to his endeavor, with So High Media, he was a producer and showrunner for ESPN and Fox, where he won six Emmys. Let me tell you that you guys are in for an amazing podcast because Yaron has stories for days. And not only that, but we take you into the production side of things as well. And I ask him about what it looks like behind the scenes to achieve some of these quality pieces of content. And I should know because I had the privilege of working with Yaron on an esports documentary for ESPN earlier this year. I wanted to have him on the show to just show you guys what it's like behind the scenes and what the role of a producer is in terms of a production. If you guys want to hop around to any part of the podcast, if you're watching this, I will put the show notes with time codes in my description and in the first comment. And then also the show notes will be available to those listening on my website, JavierMercedes.com. Don't forget that if you do get value out of this show, you can support me by sharing it out and tagging me at Javier Mercedes X. I also have my Premiere Pro preset pack that helps you animate titles on and off screen for all of those video editors out there. And I'm on Patreon. Any little bit helps and I'll have links to all of that stuff in the description below. Without further ado, let's hop into the 79th episode of Passion in Progress. What is up, Mercedes? Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion in Progress show, where we talk to inspiring individuals and hopefully through hearing their stories, you too are motivated to go out and pursue your passions. And on today's show, there's a little somebody that knows a little, just a little bit about stories. Yaron Descalo. How's it going, man? Good. How are you? I'm doing so swell. Just from people like Aaron Rodgers to Ninja and everything in between, I uh, had the pleasure of just going through your back catalog of what you've done here at So High. Mm-hmm. But that's just a little bit. A little you bit, yeah. You were at Fox and at ESPN, yep. Emmy nominated, Emmy award winning. Give a, an overview of what you're doing day to day, because I just want to give the audience sure. a, um, a grasp of the kind of productions that you're putting on. Yeah. So, you know, as we speak right now, we have a couple things in production right now, um, one of which that takes up a lot of the, the daily a uh, task of mine is a podcast that we um, executive produce here in this Sports office. Wars, Sports man. Wars, yeah. I'm a so, huge fan of Business Wars, and then I once I found out that you guys yeah. are doing Sports Wars, yeah. I was like, whoa, I listened to uh, Tyson and Holyfield. Holyfield, yeah. yeah. So that one just completed. I think we have one more interview episode with Sugar Ray Leonard that's going to uh, air this upcoming Wednesday. Um, and then we move on to Subway Series. So that, that's been very much of kind of the, the day-to-day stuff because it's an always-on show like Business War. So yeah. uh, we have two episodes every week that drops. We finally got into a, a pretty good flow where I think we're 53 episodes in to the series, which launched in April. Um, so we, we've got that down pretty good right now, but it does take a lot of our time checking over scripts listening to the mix, making sure everything's kind of locked in. We brought on someone onto the team that just kind of helps us out a little bit, kind of tap us on the back and say, hey, like time for you to listen to the mix. Or like, (laughs) hey, do you want to give any notes on this rough draft? So just to give the audience an overview. uh, So it's for Wondery. And if you haven't listened to a Wondery podcast, this isn't just like what we're doing right now in between two people. This is something that has so much sound design. There's so much story that goes into it. And there's an ebb and flow with each uh, episode. I'm assuming you have a big part of that. Can you go into detail what building an episode of that? Say it. Say it's for the uh, Mike Tyson and mm-hmm. Holyfield. What does it look like from inception to completion? Like how how do you create the script for an episode? Um, are you writing that kind of stuff? Are you just curating and making sure like this is something that would look neat for a podcast? Like how does that look from your perspective? Yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes you even have to back up a little bit to when we actually decide on a specific arc, right? So yeah, Tyson Holyfield, yeah. right? Um, that takes a little bit just to decide um, which which rivalries we really want to cover. And, and as we kind of look ahead to 2020, we have a bunch more that we're kind of tossing up in the air to see if Wondery likes them 
Tyson Holyfield was one that we've kind of liked from day one. Um, and really the way that it starts is either a writer or uh, between myself and the other producer, Gabe Goodwin, whose company Blue Duck co-produces and, and really produces it as well. Um, we decide on an arc and then we bring on a writer. Um, mm-hmm. And that writer really is the one that that kind of takes the first step to put together a pretty co- comprehensive outline. Um, putting together an outline, not unlike writing a term paper in high school um, or a book report, right? I mean, it really goes back to that. And, mm-hmm. and Wondery really taught us that from day one, that the more comprehensive that outline is, the better that the arc will be and the easier the process will be for the writer and easier for us to kind of see the gaps and the holes and the storylines and the themes that we want to push out. So once we get a writer on board, we really task them to spend two to three weeks really to dig in and read because we don't expect people to immediately be able to pick up Tyson versus Holyfield (laughs) or Clemens versus Piazza. Um, Mm -hmm. They might have a passion for it, but ultimately they want to read a biography. They want to read a lot of articles. They know the key moments and they want to, you know, read multiple sources um, watch back the fights themselves. So it's we, very in depth. It is. It, it's super <laughs> in depth. I mean, in in many ways, we have to be the authority on that. You know, mm-hmm. we don't want to make any of those mistakes. And certainly, Gabe and I, who um, have been at ESPN and been at Fox for for fifteen years, you know, we know that it's important that you know we need to be the authority when we're putting those types of podcasts out. Now, there are other people that are going to be experts on their lives, but at least in terms of the format that we're telling with Sports Wars, we want to tell it the right way. So two to three weeks really goes into that Mm -hmm. um, of putting together an outline and then we'll we'll kind of weigh in on the outline. And from a story perspective, uh, we typically have a pretty good sense of the arcs that um, we choose and we have a passion for it. So we have a sense of where we want to go, but we're learning things sometimes. Oh, we like didn't realize that, you know, Tyson was in this school or this youth academy or it was this guy yeah. that pushed him to custom auto. So we try to take an open mind when we um, read those outlines and just think of it from a storytelling perspective. Um, how can we you know, really get in their head. And that's something that Wondery really pushes out is this idea of, of perspective and POV that makes their podcast unique, I think, to other podcast companies is that they really push that perspective. Um, they do it in business wars mm-hmm. and in fr- and with sports wars, we, you know, are able to take those types of liberties and put the viewer inside or the listener inside of the head of Mike Tyson or Evander Holyfield and our host Dan Rubenstein does such a great job um, at doing that. From day one, it's really just getting the writer to lock in on that. And then once we're at that place, uh, we get that outline out to Wondery. And then it's really, you know, just start writing for the writer. And and typically, depending on how, um, how many times our writer has worked for us, you know, that first draft can be really rough or it can be in a really great spot. And we've had it all across the map. And we have a pretty good sense now from what we get yeah. What's going to be great and what's not going to be great. Sometimes that first draft involves a lot of work and a lot of rewriting for us. And sometimes it just involves kind of changing some points of view, pushing a couple notes, and and then it goes over to the Wondery side. They give some notes and then it goes through kind of a final cut stage, at which point our host jumps in, he voices it. We get it off to a sound designer who kind of comes in, adds sound effects, um, assembles Dan's voice and then adds music. We give two or three passes on that. And then once that's complete, we throw the ad in there and it makes it to everybody else's (laughs) airwaves. So um, we have a lot of people that are helping us out throughout that process from PAs that help us assemble Dan's voice to engineers that will do Dan's ads. Um, So there, there are a lot of people that do a lot of small things, but all those small things add up. So we're really fortunate to have a great team and, and the support from Wondery after having done it for now seven full arcs. Yeah. Um, your your responsibility as the producer is yeah. to take all of this idea and if Wondery comes to you and you have the project, it's your job to get it done. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> they very rarely hadn't um, gone out of house. Um, most of their producers. Really? Yeah, I mean, they, they'd use writers before, obviously. But I think for the most part, they were really producing in-house. This was the first time, and they told us that, you know, you need to learn our style. But this is the first time we're really like hiring a, a production company to go and take this on. Um, so that that was kind of neat and daunting in the beginning. We, we really, 
you know, approached it, even though we feel like we were vets in kind of the the storytelling or the sports production business, I think uh, we both really just kind of looked at it as um, we don't know their style and we have to teach ourselves. I mean, podcasting is a different beast than, you know, a documentary. You know, a lot of it, oh, it's just storytelling. Um, <laughs> Famous last not. words. <laughs> but it's, yeah, right. But it's it's not. It was a learning curve. They said to us, you know, we want to get to a point where almost you guys just kind of hand us a, a mix and we give notes on that. You know, we don't want to have to read, you know, script after script after script. We want you to kind of be there as our voices be channeling what we would otherwise say so that when it comes to our eyes or comes to our ears, it's really far along. And and I don't think we're fully there yet, but we're getting pretty close. Um, we What we try to do with new writers is kind of channel Wondery. Yeah. Instead of saying, do this, do that, we just say, well, we know a note's going to come this way <laughs> um, if we don't go point of view here or if we're switching between first and last name. Just so many of the things that were just drilled into us in that first arc, um, Brett Favre versus Aaron Rodgers, and, and really in the first two or three you know, Roger Federer and um, Rafael Nadal and, and Jordan and Isaiah. I mean, we were really drilled in to a lot and it was painstaking to get it right. But uh, we feel so much more confident. And they have such a great workflow at Wondery. We're so fortunate to to work with really these storytellers that have a, a great sense of how to tell stories with podcasts. And, and it is. It's a totally different beast than yeah. I think what I have done in the past. What's the timeline? Timeline, um, typically about two months from the time that we really get like an arc um, greenlit. And, and this then is one story. What, what, this is like one, one like five part story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, two months or so. From A to B, there's so much attention to detail that's in there. There is, yeah. I mean, it's 4,000 words per episode, roughly 4,000, mm-hmm. 4, 4,500 words. So that's all written. And then, you know, you're, especially with sports, you know, Business Wars kind of takes the tack that they sometimes recreate some conversations, which we'll yeah. do as well. Um, but we also have a lot of game calls that we use, yeah. as, you know, so so digging and finding those and, and we're not necessarily writing to those per se. But, you know, when we did Maguire Sosa, you know, we spent almost an entire episode in, in a game that Maguire and Sosa face each other in September, you know, so you, you really have to, you know, do all that research and and Brendan Joyce, who wrote that one, did a phenomenal job. I mean, he was locked in on that. He watched the entire game. He knew exactly what game calls he wanted to use. I mean, what announcer clips he wanted to use. So it is um, a pretty arduous process, but it's it's really gratifying to see when it when it comes together. And we've gotten such great feedback, you know, from folks that we have probably haven't heard from in five, ten years. Are like. <laughs> Oh, like I was listening to Sports Wars. I heard your name at the end. Like that's that's crazy, you know. So, yeah. you know, I I could do a number of different things on TV, and people just don't know I'm doing them. So mm-hmm. no one's ever commenting on it. But you know, this is one where people, you know, are are driving to work and they're listening to it. And and I think in the sports world, we have so many podcasts that are you know based off of TV shows, right? That yeah. work, you know, Talking Heads and such. This is long form. So I think we have a, a really great space that we're um, occupying right now and hopefully it teaches others to kind of get after and that people are really interested in this type of content yeah and i remember when i first met you we were talking about story in general and how it takes precedence and everybody will always always enjoy a good story and if it takes you a certain amount of time to tell that story it's worth it let's segue that into earlier in your career or wherever you want to jump off from um, and tell people about the visual side of what Mm. you do yeah so I started uh, I had a couple stints at ESPN um, as as an intern and, and really like learned a lot even as an intern in ESPN Classic and kind of work on the 100th anniversary of, of the Yankees project that they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and really just, you know, what PAs and interns do, which is logging tape and finding tape and um, sitting and scrolling through three quarter tape and betas <laughs> and things like that or trying to find, um, you know, nuggets or, yeah. you know, these little gold mines of, of content. So there was that. And then um, having gone back to school for law school and business school, um, then 2007, I um, linked up with one of my former bosses at ESPN, and they were launching the show E60. Um, even though <laughs> I've heard of it, yeah. <laughs> even though I was like fresh out of law school, 
um, 10 days removed from taking the Connecticut and New York bar exams. I kind of knew I wasn't going to practice. Um, obviously, by then, I was, I was pretty certain. And so this was a great fit to be able just to walk back into the producing game. And this was August of 2007. Um, and, and E60 was, was launching that fall. So it was really neat. Um, That's awesome. 12 days later, I was in Spain working on a story on uh, what we called baby bullfighters, which were um, kids that fought bulls, um, <laughs> yeah, which was which was an awesome story. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Our, our main character was a, a bullfighter named uh, Jairo Miguel, who was actually from Spain, but was fighting out of Mexico um, because in Spain you couldn't fight bulls until you're 16, and he was 14 at the time. Um, but he had this really gruesome injury that was caught on film when he was trying to do uh, a type of trick with the bull coming right at him. He was on his knees and kind of holding the capota and mm -hmm. like the bull's torn went right through his Whoa. sternum and he, he survived. And so we we ended up kind of telling the story and it was, you know, in some respect a little bit about not necessarily child abuse per se, but like, mm -hmm. you know, should these kids be uh, bullfighting? So you know, the visual side of things, I remember going over there and we found like, you know, I, I was never accustomed really to kind of the bullfighting world. Um, but being there in Spain and going to them, and, and this was, you know, 12 years ago, this is not a discussion necessarily about PETA or animal just, rights. Yeah, I'm, just, yeah. <laughs> I'm just simply talking about what bullfighting is to the people that do like it. Um, but it was like an opera. It was like going to a play. Mm -hmm. You know, I I didn't expect that. You know, people dressed up and like, you know, when they were about to kill the bull, like everyone's like completely silent and it's it's very much like um, some big moment is happening in theater. Um, so we, you know, as far as like the visual side for us, like we thought about how are we going to tell this story in a way that, um, you know, exhibits that. And we, we got an artist that we found in Spain to kind of help us as, as kind of this visual thread to, you know, paint that was kind of moving us through this entire, you know, feature that we did that ended up being 12, 13 minutes. And, and E60 did such a great job from day one saying that they wanted to have the journalism that 60 Minutes and Outside the Lines had, um, but they wanted to take some risks visually. And they always pushed us to find ways to visually tell the story. This was not about, you know, your, your B-roll of the character being them walking down uh, the hallway with your talent. This, this was not what that was. This was, you know, fine. You just described so much sports <laughs> B-roll. <laughs> I've got that B-roll. Right? Um, so they were just very much, you know, like, how do we, you know, make the, this whole story come alive? And, and still to this day, you know, I could probably go back and watch it. And there are so many things I would do differently on it. But it was a great kind of first piece for me to do. Um, you know, 40, 60, and, and for, for them to really give me the opportunity over a period of five years to really travel the world and just tell some really incredible stories, work some in, with some incredible producers, Andy Tennant, and Robert Abbott, um, among them, I mean, just probably the best sports producers that exist today um, were the ones that created that show. So they had kind of the journalism down, but they had the visual down. These were Emmy winners. And and I essentially went to school learning from them. I and mean, mm -hmm. that's what it was. And, and you know, but then also got to travel the world and, <laughs> and tell really cool stories. So it couldn't have been any better. Yes, yeah, you're telling stories, but that in and of itself is a, you're living a story. Yeah, <laughs> I really felt that way. Yeah, for, for a period of time. Any of them stick out? Yeah, I mean, we did um, we did one in Liberia um, on the amputee soccer team. Um, you know, so, so many young men lost their limbs during the African conflicts of the eighties and nineties, um, and even early two thousands. We did a story on the Liberian team that, um, you know, had a ton of different players, um, that had either lost their legs or lost their arms. Uh, the, the story and the characters that we focused on there specifically were, a goalie, Joseph, who was a child soldier and had his arm blown off um, from an RPG. And then on his team was a, a striker by the name of Richard who had lost his leg in a fairly uh, infamous church massacre that happened in Monrovia when he was an infant. Um, and people didn't think he would survive because they chopped off his leg. Well, literally, he was an infinite. Jesus. Um, so he kind of grows up and, and without, with just one leg and, 
you know, um, over in Liberia being uh, an amputee was a, a reminder to a lot of people of what the wars were, and they were brutal in Liberia, the civil wars. And so, so many people didn't give the amputees any type of respect as a result of that, right? Because of what had happened to them. And it just reminded people of, of really the terrible time. So anyhow, this team ends up winning the African Amputee World Cup, which is among all of the um, African nations that had competed, that had amputees. Um, and it was, a, it was a neat story between these two guys who, again, were essentially on opposite sides of the war. Um, but we're playing for the same team and kind of trying to unify uh, a heel nation. So that was really incredible to go to to Liberia for eight days and had an incredible crew. Greg Herdeman was my DP out there, and we just just immersed ourselves in kind of the story. and And then when we came back and had all all the goods, uh, Paul Carruthers was our editor, and we actually got Nas to voice it for us. That's um, awesome. Which was which was great timing because he was coming out with an album um, with Damian Marley about Africa. Um, so it was really like perfect timing. He voiced it, and then we end up winning an Emmy for it, which was just really cool um, and just you know a testament to kind of all the hard work. So that that was just like you know a, a flash in time from 2008 to be able to have that opportunity and to go over there because you know I always kind of felt as a producer, especially on the ones that that were overseas that you know, it was my job to show people what it's like to be there because yeah. no one is going to go to Liberia, right? I mean, just very few people in this world will have that opportunity or want to go to Liberia. So it's my job as a producer to make people smell it and hear it and feel it um, through the visuals and through the story that we're telling. And so I always kind of took that wherever we went. We got to travel to Bahrain and Serbia and Spain and England and Venezuela and um, we went to a Venezuelan prison and we've done a lot of stories where people I just know will never go. So it was like my job to kind of visually tell people what it's like to be there and to see it and feel it. And, and E60 gave us that opportunity. I think that's one of the attributes of an amazing producer, what you're talking about. You have to be willing to go to get the stories in the places where people are not yeah. willing to go. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? And yeah, sure. I can tell a great story. Actually. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. We were uh, in Venezuela, in a Venezuelan prison, which I alluded to a couple seconds ago. We were doing a story on a baseball player, Uget Ur Urbina, who... Um, was convicted of attempted murder of his farmhands. Um, story essentially goes is he got drunk one night, thought his farmhands had stolen something, his gun or something, came back um, and lit him on fire, you know, poured gas on him, lit him on fire. And then this I went completely <laughs> where I didn't see yeah. this going. Wow. <laughs> so he, yeah, so he, I think, came to his senses and let the guys like jump in the water in his pool, but not before they, you know, they survived and then obviously turned him in and, he was sentenced, I think, to 14 years in a in a Venezuelan prison. Venezuelan prisons are pretty interesting. Um, so we we went down there, and it was a kind of a joint story with ESPN Deportes. Um, and I went down with with my reporter Jeremy Schapp, who I did so many of these great stories with, and and is by far the best sports correspondent ever um, as a journalist. As a, and he's got a producer's mind. Um, and, and we went down there and we interviewed Urbina, but like the first time that we went to this prison, I didn't know anything about Venezuelan prisons. I mean, why would I? <laughs> <laughs> but the first time we went there, there was someone being wheeled out with a sheet over their head. Um, and as they explained to me, as our- I'm laughing at this yeah. right now, but this is like super uneasy, yeah, this, man. I was like, whoa, I was like, that's not good. You know, but whatever, you don't really think much of it. But we were eventually told that- you know, Venezuelan prisons, there are no guards. The guards are on the outside. So it's really just like a bad kid's camp. You know, they just throw everybody on the inside. So that was just like interesting spending a couple days in there. Um, Urbina was obviously there. He was, you know, a pretty big star there. So he was well thought of by the prisoners. So we kind of felt like if we were with him, even though we had hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of camera equipment and things like that, that no one would really say anything to us. And for the most part, we felt, you know, in pretty good hands, you know, his cell, um, was 
was pretty interesting. It, there were no doors on the cells. It was just like wide open. He had direct TV. He had a refrigerator. He had a double bed. He had an air conditioner. Uh, his girlfriend at the time would make him three meals, right? Um, but I didn't know that until I like obviously physically went up there and we were out on the basketball court inside the prison and I was talking to Urbina and I was like, hey, like, we need to like go see your cell, you know? And this wasn't like you have to go ask a guard or anything. I mean, he can just take us up there. Um, and so he's like, okay, come on. He's like, but no cameras, just you and our fixer, which was a, a, a Venezuelan woman of, of all places, you know, to be a, a men's prison. Yeah. But, so the three of us like walk up there. He like brings us up. It's like a corner cell. Um, and we sit down and he opens the fridge and he hands each of us a beer. And we're just like sitting there in his cell and he's kind of like showing me around. I mean, it's not huge, obviously, but it's not what you expect a prison cell to be. And we're, his TV is on. He's yeah. showing me his freezer with the meals at his girlfriend. And I was like, hey, man, like, you know, we, we have to bring the cameras up here. Like you were you're a World Series winning pitcher. Like people need to know how you're living right now. You know, I can't just tell people that you're in a Venezuelan prison without them necessarily knowing what it's like for you to be here. Um, and so it took a beer to to get him <laughs> to commit to, to like agree to do it. But he had to ask the guy who was like, two cells down who is no bigger than I am. So like five, five, but he was like the boss of the prison. Wow. He was like the <laughs> boss. And that guy was like, yeah, he can do it as long as like they show me in one of the shots. Like, <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> so like we bring our cameras up and like, we're in this kind of like ancient prison and we shoot him, you know, Jeremy and him like walking through the prison. And I felt very much like, you know, people needed to see that. And those are kind of the stories of how you get those types of shots, you know. And um, I was in my 20s at the time and probably a little bit stupid and didn't care about much and just believed I could get things done <laughs> and certainly didn't fear anything. But yeah, just like going up there and sitting and being like, yeah, like we have to show people what it's like. It's great to see you playing hoops. It's great to see you kind of walking amongst the other prisoners um, but that that doesn't show where you like actually live. And he was all all for it. But it was it was really neat. Just like I remember the moment just like sitting in his like prison cell and being like, we we just have to show people. What <laughs> we, got is. we got the shot. Yeah, we <laughs> got to get it. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Being behind the scenes. I know what it takes to get some of those shots. And yeah. I, I like how you actually explain what it took to get yeah. one of those shots. Yeah. And when I, and I think the big player right now in the documentary world is the places like Netflix and things of that nature where people can uh, appreciate that art form. And when I see a lot of these kinds of shots, say it's like a, a shot under the ocean or so, some really um, rare place. Some people might just have that. Oh, it's cool that you have this shot of this yeah. one tiger. But then you watch it behind the scenes and it took him like three winters going to the same place, sitting out in the, some like really obscure place just to get that shot of like a tiger that's like only two in the world. Yes. So that right. whole thing. Um, can you explain what kind of crew are on these kinds of shoots when you go if you want to like kind of segue this into a different story and. Um, how big are, is a crew when you go to shoot something or how condensed is it? How much time do you have to, uh, mm -hmm. if it's a sporting event and what are you looking for when it comes to like a game day or something like that? And you're like, all right, we thought the story was something like this, but then you got to take it another way. Yeah. Wh wh whatever. I'm giving you so many different things. Yeah. What yeah, do you, yeah. What do you want to no, talk no. about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I. To start with, I mean, I think when you think about the crew, right, in, yeah. especially in these types of stories, you really need to have a crew that that is aligned with the producer and is willing to take risks. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, if it's my job to have the viewer see what they'll never experience, it's going to come from the lens of one of my shooters. So they have to be hungry and they have to want to get into places where they like wouldn't cells <laughs> yeah like like they have to be unafraid to 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 do those types of things and so many of the ones that um for example the one in venezuela was was a crew joe lamonico who you know back in the day was like one of the networks like you know dps that would go into war zones in you know um central america 
So he was accustomed to that, you know, um, they're accustomed to going into places, you know, you, you as an editor, you know, um, that just like producers, like there is kind of a little bit of a box that you can say, yeah. oh, like producers are like weird like this, or <laughs> sound designers are weird. Like, yeah. like shooters are by their nature, the best of the ones are by their nature, a little bit crazy, yeah. um, but really confident and like, no, they need to get the shot. I mean, no different than probably photographers have always been since the art form began. It's like, you're only as good as the shot that you get. So like you have to go and go and get that shot. And I think everyone that naturally holds those cameras know, and now the cameras are so much lighter and thinner and easier to like get into spaces that you wouldn't otherwise get into. But um, we, we've had so many opportunities where we've, um, you know, been in places where, um, for example, we were in Serbia at one point and we were trying to uh, get an interview with a, um, basketball player who he had fled the country. He was on trial for felony assault and his mom essentially got him a um, passport to get him out of the country and back to Serbia. And so we flew to Serbia to try to find him and do an interview with him. And, and we thought we were going to get an interview when we got on the ground. His lawyer was like, yeah, yeah, I'll give you an interview with him. And then like they flaked. And so I was like, you know, screw this. Like <laughs> I know where he is because I knew he was playing for like a second tier basketball team in Serbia. So I like made a couple phone calls to like the one person like, in Serbia. This is why they hire you. <laughs> <laughs> I, made, I made some phone calls to like the one guy who was doing like, you know, had the Euro League basketball homepage of Serbia and updated it because he cared about Serbian basketball. I knew what team he played on. I knew where they practiced. Mm -hmm. And so we just like went up one night. We knew they were playing one night. And so I was like, he's going to come here. So like, we're going to set up one camera here and like one camera over here. And then I'm going to be on the third camera. Um, and when he comes, like, we're going to get our moment of not necessarily the ambush, but like the question, like, why did you flee the country? What do you have to say to Brian Steinhauer? Mm -hmm. And so we we did that. And I remember, you know, he was 6'9", <laughs> um, 260. That's no and small he, person. And he was, he, the, the crime that he had committed was he had essentially stepped on somebody's head for 30 seconds with his like size 16 sneakers and knocked that kid into a coma for two months. Um, and essentially you know, created permanent brain damage for this kid. So I remember when we saw him, we were very much like, uh, okay, like it's on, like here he comes. <laughs> and I remember I was like the guy with like the mini DV camera. This is 10 years ago, like standing in front of the door, uh, of the, of the basketball arena. And that's where he needed to go. And I was like, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. I'm, not moving. I'm <laughs> waiting for him to come. Like until this like Hulk of a guy who like literally could have just like pushed my head through the glass, but him like coming right at me. And so getting that type of shot. So, um, you know, having a crew that's unafraid to, to take those risks as well, a reporter that's unafraid to take those risks as well. Um, th that's, you know, taking people to places that, like you said, you know, getting that one shot, you know, takes a lot of planning, sometimes a lot of luck as well. But you just I think we as producers just innate have kind of over the years have just been able to kind of say, like, what's the shot here that people really want to see and how do we get that shot? And it never seems to work out exactly the way you want it, but it does. If you plan it the right way, you put yourself in the best position, I think, to succeed and get what you need. Can you talk about what you do versus where I do a lot of my content, YouTube and everything? Can you talk about the differences there and why? I mean, I love quality so much, but can you explain what what's your drive there? What's your passion to continue to do the kinds of stories that you're doing? I mean, just from the references that you're bringing up, it's very deep. It's very like dark stuff sometimes what you're the stuff that you're covering. Why is it so important to you? Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely think it's it's evolved you know i mean e60 i think based on my background i i had a little bit more of a sense of kind of the the journalistic investigative side and was was kind of unafraid to go down those routes and um having put myself through law school um i think i could read a document fairly quickly so i understood i think you know 
when there was something that had a little bit more meat on the bone, it, it wasn't necessarily intimidating just because, you know, having gone to law school, you it's just learning a new language anyhow. So um, I think that was very much what I had done for, you know, five years. I think since then, I think it's it's very much been a different type of producing. I mean, the thing that we worked on together was was more esports driven. Yeah. We do a boxing show now. I think it's always important to get people hooked. And I think there's always that just unity of story. Yeah. Um, some of it can be dark and and scary and investigative and getting the the crazy shot, but um they all kind of have the same type of tenants. We do a boxing show where um, we get the two guys to sit in a room before they're about to fight and, you know, whether they talk shit to each other or not, but just like getting them inside of a room. And we have kind of crafted the show where we get each of them individually and kind of the car ride on the way to, um, the event. And I think, um, or at least to their face to face and even the name in, of the show, yeah, <laughs> plug, um, it's but, on Fox. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's really important too, is, is we, we look at that show and we say, okay, in the first six minutes of that show, which is essentially segment one, we need to give the audience someone to root for or root against. And I think that that's just the same. That's what we all do in sports all the time. It's when we're watching a live event, you know, they're pushing storylines for you to pick who to root and who, who to root for and who to root against. And I think um, what I try to do more than anything is assume that my audience doesn't know a ton about um, either subject or either team and try to get, give them a sense to know, like get them, give them a stake into why they should care or not care or why they should care for somebody, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and I think that that is, that's across the board, right? That that's the essence of, of storytelling. And certainly in kind of the sports world. And I think Um, I think having the education as a sports storyteller makes so many of us that have done it really great storytellers all around because we're just innately like pushed to like make someone care about something. I love that. man. I love that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Right. Like it's just, it just, it's, it's at our core, right? Like Mm -hmm. the bullfighter, like you needed to be invested through the first nine minutes of the story about this kid, his survival he was him putting his life on the line so that when we were there for his comeback fight in Mexico, uh, five months after he had gotten gored and he got gored again and we were there for it, you know, like we had to keep people invested, you know, and, th- and that's just the essence of of keeping the audience going. And I think there's some really incredible um, scripted producers that just understand that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, to be able to write to make you care. And, and we do mostly unscripted. Um, but we try to find the nuggets, whether it's something very serious or something very light to just keep people, um, in a sense to know a backstory and say, well, like, oh, you know, he had a daughter that was born with spina bifida. So like, I want to root for that guy. Sometimes it's just like that little nugget, but that's all comes in kind of the research and the storytelling in the way that we bring that out. One of the ones that I watched from you where I didn't know where it was going in the beginning was um, uh, the letters from Jeffrey. Uh, so that so the Dallas Cowboys manager uh, and Jerry, I, Jones, yeah. Jerry, Jerry, sorry, Jerry Jones. Yep. And um, if you want to elaborate on sure. kind of like a, a synopsis of the story. But to me, I watched the first what you were just saying, the first nine minutes. And I was like, Holy, these are really sad things happening. Like, how does this tie in? And then yeah. after the commercial break, then it comes back. And I'm like. Oh, this is so cool. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, in a in an okay way. But yeah, yeah. some of the stories you covered in that, I was crying watching it. And then like it's a testament to what you do. Yeah. And I, I there's a bunch of different examples, but if you want to give kind of what that story was. Yeah, that's so that story was um um after I'd left Fox, I, you know, had started my own company and and had worked for actually my old boss at Fox, um, Mike Hughes, who owned a production company called DLP, and they had gotten a contract for a show, a pilot on the NFL network called uh NFL Football Families, which was kind of highlighting some family type stories from the NFL. And it was an hour long show that we oversaw. And um the this piece specifically was about how um, Jerry Jones would write letters. The owner of the Cowboys would write letters to Cowboys fans 
uh, who lost a loved one, right? So we had learned of the story of a Sacramento, I believe, police officer who was killed in the line of duty. Uh, I think his last name was uh, French. I don't know if it was Robert French. It's been a minute. But um, either way, he he had lost his life in the line of duty and uh, his wife had mentioned that he was a Cowboys fan and, and word had trickled to Jerry Jones that he was a Cowboy fan and, and simply sending a letter, you know, meant a lot to these families. You know, Jerry Jones is a billionaire. He's a Super Bowl winner. He's probably the most famous owner in sports. Um, but he took the time to to write these types of letters. Um, and, and we started to find that more and more often. There was a, a teenager here who was murdered. And no one really knew what happened uh, in Santa Monica and his family. They were huge um, Cowboys fans and and they got a letter and a signed ball from him. It was like this, I the, they couldn't believe the one, the one with the little girl in the little girl Savannah. I was in like, Savannah, oh my right? Gosh, right. that in your so tell, we, tell a little bit of what it is. But yeah. after you guys showed a little clip of it, and I was like, no, you're not going to show this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. The the idea that you know she was killed, and again, like. Jerry, um, I think he brought them to a game, you yeah. know, and brought them to the yeah. sideline. And, you know, the Cowboys is one of the, they're one of the most iconic brands in all of sports, if not the most iconic brand that exists, certainly one of the top ones in the NFL. And um, it was just a way to kind of show, I think, what uh, he as an owner had done. And, and it's neat when we're able to kind of find a through line through. So it's not just, you know, about Savannah. Uh, or about the Castillo family, or about the French family. It was like there was this kind of common thread throughout, and we were probably just like scratching the surface of of the things that had been done. And I I just think it allowed us to humanize Jerry Jones a little bit more. Again, whether you hate him or you love him, I happen to be a Packer fan, so you know how I probably <laughs> feel about the Cowboys in general. But it was just a way to get people to think in a different way that they wouldn't have otherwise thought of Jerry Jones. And I think that when you have that opportunity in storytelling to give people some, give people a sense of something they wouldn't have otherwise thought surprise them in some way, I think that's really, really important, you know, and maybe that's the thing people remember now about Jerry Jones. People that may not be huge football fans may have seen that story and that's what they'll remember. Not, about holdouts and money and oil and yeah. whatever it's, it's so we really enjoyed telling that one specifically because I think it was completely unexpected from from what you know the NFL world knew about Jerry Jones you know certainly had been covered locally but not nationally at that point. Yeah, and going back to uh, making people care, or at least giving a chance for whatever the subject matter is, for whatever story that you're telling, giving it, uh, giving them some insight into whatever that subject matter is. I kind of liken it to if you're if the TV's off or on in the distance, and you, maybe you hear something about the Cowboys or something like that, then it clicks in your head, and you're like, oh, by the way, I saw this one story about yeah. the owner and things like that, and then it kind of ties you to them as a brand it and does. all that kind of stuff. It's for sure. Really cool. You putting it in that context because yeah. now it kind of like brings it full circle for me. When I think of like sports and everything in general, you're bringing ideas to the masses that they don't they may not have an idea of in the first place. How do you choose your stories? Because you you, you kind of grazed by it with like, you know, where there's the, the meat on the bone. But yeah. how do you how do you choose your stories? I think it has to have, you know, worldwide appeal. I think yeah, that that's yeah. really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has to be unexpected in some respect. I mean, one story we just did for the Golf Channel that'll air in a couple of weeks or a couple of months uh, was on a golfer in the slums of Argentina, of Buenos Aires, you know, a place where everybody just plays soccer. And here was the kid who grew up uh, playing golf and always had a dream of getting out of the slums to play. So that's just like so unexpected. Um, I think um, it's important to visually, you know, where can you take people in a place where they wouldn't otherwise be? I think that I always will go back to that, you know, to see people in the slums of Argentina, I think, um, you know, brings people to a place where they wouldn't otherwise go. And then it just, it has that tie that just kind of keeps people engaged. And then I would say the last thing is the opportunity to tell a story differently. 
um, and not just do it the, the traditional way. I, I kind of feel like some stories demand that you just, you know, tell them in a way where you have a reporter or a voiceover that get it done. And then there are others that allow you to take a little bit more risk in terms of how you tell that story, whether you script it out, um, whether you use first person, whether you use other people to kind of tell the story, whether you use a celebrity voice. So um, I think if I can kind of take um, one way that I, or at least I approach stories now, I think that's that's very important, right? But, um, you know, the, the, the piece that we worked on um, in, uh, the apex, um, Legend. documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The apex legends documentary that we did, you know, I think we were looking for specific stories that would, you know, jump mm-hmm. off the page that just would again, make people like, who do I want to root for? And you actually had an idea. You had an idea of some people, but, some people, go, but right. going there and actually yeah. during the event, you started to formulate more. Yeah. I mean, I can remember the moment we were, uh, one of the first nights, I think it was right before the tournament started or the, the a couple of days before. Um, and we were just meeting some of the guys. I mean, there were 60 um, gamers playing in this tournament. And that's a lot to keep track of. Yeah. And, and we had a sense from, you know, talking with EA and ESPN about um, some people we thought we might want to cover um, just based on their kind of storyline. But I definitely felt comfortable going to the event and saying, okay, we're going to do at least three backstories, two of which I have a pretty good sense of, and we'll shoot beforehand. We'll shoot the best player and we'll shoot a guy who, you know, is kind of a legend in the sport. But the third story, we have a couple ideas, but let's, let's see what happens. Let's meet people, you know, nothing better than just like getting to meet people. And and so we had this opportunity to, um, go to like a, just a, a basketball tournament, um, not a tournament, but just like a pickup game, you know, one of the nights, you know, this between whole community. The gamers. <laughs> yeah, between the gamers. They were just, you know, getting out. They were just yeah. hanging out like, hey, 20 of us just like we got nothing else to do. Let's just like go play hoops. There's a there's a court. And I remember we were walking with the guys and, and they were just kind of walking to the court. And one of my producers who worked on it, you know, started, you know, talking to one of the gamers who was talking about how he was homeless. And, you know. Ding. Yeah, the light bulb just went off, you know, and it was like that. We we just got to go. We just got to cover this guy. Well, what's his story? And we, we start to learn a little bit more about him. And, and then you just kind of you get your laser focus as a yeah. producer and you just say, OK, like, what do we need to tell this story? We got to get him to sit down. We need to talk about his life. We need to, you know, ask him about his life. We need to, you know, focus on him. We got to wake up in the morning with him, go to sleep with him. You know, those types of things that give you that all access type of feel um, and that's when we put on that hat, but it, but it's all in kind of the story gathering and I, and honestly that came from Ben Redman, who is one of the producers on the shoot. And you just have to give people that opportunity to, to story gather, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. and get after it, you know, mm-hmm. it's a total team effort and, you know, it's then our job to kind of, you know, make it sing into kind of a, a full film and, and find the moments that, will help us kind of go through the ebbs and flows of the entire weekend. But it does start with just actually finding that story and, and was so thrilled to kind of learn about that story yeah. um, and kind of the receptiveness of that specific game or to actually sit down and tell a story. And then throughout the arc of the actual games, it actually turned out that he was finishing in a good spot. Yeah. So it's like, whoa, yeah, we, yeah, have yeah. A, we have a climax yeah. here and all this other stuff. You yeah, know? We, we, <laughs> yeah, if you talk to some of my shooters, they sometimes seem to like believe that I have this like ability to like <laughs> play marionette and get, get things. <laughs> we, we did a we did an event in May where, you know, there was nothing else that we wanted more than these two collegiate esports teams to play each other in because the semi following them because we were a following them and b they just had like this like great rivalry mm-hmm. um and them getting to play each other in the semifinal uh, was not that far fetched and it ended up happening but the game itself played out where it went to like the fifth and final game the <laughs> fifth the, the third and final That's map awesome. to like overtime and so you know, sometimes you get really lucky with those things, but really at that point, you're just trying to put your team in a position to just like cover what you believe is is the best story and then, you know, let the talented people get the shots that you need um, to yeah. be able to tell that story. 
this this touches on and I think it's a theme that we've talked throughout the podcast but uh, a lot of like solopreneurs and entrepreneurs listen to the podcast and I think being a producer and a director in your position lends itself to uh, delegating Mm -hmm. and like you've been saying really trusting your team can you talk in a little bit about that and how it formulates itself throughout a production so like when you're out at the production there's the shooters and then you had the PAs and other things like that how do you formulate a good team and how does that manifest itself yeah I mean there's a lot of elements that go into it I think you know just on kind of the bare bones level formulating a great team I think you try to work with people that you've entrusted before that have delivered for you. So it always starts there. Um, oftentimes we have to bring on people that we've never worked with before. And and I'm very much a believer that if someone I trust vouches for somebody else, whether I know him or her or not, um, I'm going to hire that person. Um, if, if someone says that person is going to be great, trust me, I've worked with them. That's sometimes all I need. And, and I very, very rarely get burned, you know, in that. So, so there is that. And then I think, you know, as a producer um, and a director in some of these things, I think we need to take ownership first and foremost. You know, we need to believe what we're telling before anybody else is going to believe in it. Um, it's That's powerful. Our, <laughs> it's, it's our job to, because if the people that are working for me or with me really uh, see that I might not be fully invested, then they're not going to be fully invested. Um, so it's really my job to. Do you have a specific example of that? Because I, I, I want to. To me, I've been in the in that same exa- as an editor. Yeah. When you're editing something and you know that the producer is like, "This is just another thing for that paycheck." You, you can see it in the final edit. Mm-hmm. Um. Can you? I don't know if it's a good thing to like. Can you give me an example of like when you just weren't into something and then the, <laughs> yeah. the project like yeah. went to whatever? Yeah. Or the vice versa, where yeah. you thought something wasn't going to be as good but then you're like i really think there's a story here or something like that yeah off the top of my head not, not to say it hasn't yeah. happened uh, i can't think of one right now but yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah but come back to me on it but but you're absolutely right yeah. i mean just the idea that like when you are just kind of like mailing it in and then all of a sudden the product doesn't come out the way you want it to be i mean yeah right like mm-hmm no shit that that happened because (laughs) because you weren't invested in it Mm -hmm. and people are only going to be as invested as you are um but i i think that it always starts there you know because people are looking to you for direction you Mm -hmm. know um we very much when when we're in the field and back and at it we we delegate but at the same time everyone's voice matters you know so if you can get people invested um, you give them the opportunity to contribute um, in ways that are extremely meaningful. Um, and because I can't be in four edit rooms at the same time, you really yeah. have to trust people um, to kind of take the vision. Um, but you also have to be really effective in the feedback that you're giving people um, and not flip flopping. I mean, we've all had managers before that, you know, come in and say one thing and you do it and then. They come back two days later and they tell you the opposite. And you're like, well, this is absurd. Like, Sometimes you need to see it in the edit a certain way to be like, well, that definitely didn't work <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry you spent the last two days yeah, doing that. Right. We're going to go a different way. <laughs> and, and I feel like, you know, there's nothing more frustrating when uh, it's always been this way. Right. But there's nothing more frustrating when. Um, you know, you get notes on something that's like, yeah, just like tweak that music at it, you know, like just can you trim off that last 10 seconds uh, of this section, yeah. which, in, or, or cut out 10 seconds in the middle, right? Screws then you're everything. everything, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. and, and so I have a pretty good sense of like what, um, you know, what changes mean what, right? Yeah. Like 10 seconds doesn't mean 10 minutes sometimes. 10 seconds can mean a half a day of edit. Um, so I'm pretty cognizant of those things. So especially in these fast turnarounds, it's really important, I think, to have a plan and to just like go after it. Yeah. Um, and you just have to have certain expectations. I want everything to be 100% done, but I've had enough live experience um, overseeing shows at ESPN and Fox Sports where you you walk away from it and you realize you hated 30 things there. Yeah. But it's live and you mm-hmm. just have to deal with it. You know, whereas when I was on E60 and I have, you know, three months to put together a 13 minute piece, like 
there should be no stone unturned, right? Yeah. And so I I use both sides of my brain for those types of um, projects. You know, some of our boxing shows have a turnaround of 48 hours. Some of them have a turnaround of, of three weeks. Mm -hmm. They have to have slightly different expectations, not necessarily in the sense that like we can have a black hole in the 48 hour turnaround, but you know, there might be, oh, I really wish we would have change that music right there. I really wish we could have continued cutting cameras right here. I really wish I would have asked this question. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to have those, I think experience helps bring a lot oh, yeah. of that in there. Um, and just kind of, you know, getting the team together to really believe in what they're doing, um, but also not making them spin their wheels at all. And, and I think um, hopefully that's, the clients that I have would probably say that that's probably the mo the the thing that one of the things that I can do best, which is just take direction from them and just execute um, based on the people that I bring on that that are part of the team that can just like go and put their head down and make it great. And we know all what we want to do to make it good. So, but that also like look, I mean, we have like really talented people. I mean, yeah. that's not like yeah. I, I I know when I don't have like great talented people but i really try to surround myself with people that do their job better mm -hmm. than i could i try to I, I would say what i really try to do is you know know a lot of things really well but hire people that know one thing really great you know be able to speak the language right Just gonna chop that little sound bite out there and <laughs> like there's yeah. a great part of the podcast <laughs> yeah right but you know i mean it, it it's it's just knowing I'm not going to be able to sit and edit like you can edit, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to be able to keep up with you, but if I can understand what you're doing and I can watch your fingers moving things, I can say, no, no, no like move it two more frames that way. Mm -hmm. Um, or if it's music or if it's shooting, like, again, I can't, you know, shoot a red camera anywhere near the DPs that do it, even the second cameras. But if I can understand it a little bit and speak the language, then I don't at least like look like a fraud to these people. I'm fully cognizant to say to people that you do what you do better, but I want you to do it you do better. <laughs> yeah. And I think that was something that um, I, I take a lot of pride in is, is, you know, finding people that own their space. But in what I, as a producer, I think the best of producers are ones that can speak all the languages, but bring out, but understand who is really great at what they do and bring those people on and empower them with clear direction. That's a, so I was about to say that exactly what I think awesome producers do is they have that capacity to look at an edit and have the most efficient way of saying, all right, these are the things that we need to change X, Y and Z. Yeah, let's do that. And just like you said, you have also the uh, the knowledge of it's going to take maybe this to do this kind of thing. So I'll let you to your devices to do that thing and then I'll go on and move to the next yeah. thing. The other part too, um, just working on the one project that we did that I loved is that you you have uh, the different processes there, and this gets back to uh, letting people do their single um, task. Is just the idea of script writing and then writing the stuff for the VO in the background. You get an idea of what you want written on the page, then you send it off to somebody to be like, "Look, make sure that this is said well." It's yeah. just like like you're even down to that level yeah. of just the scripts themselves, and like, here's a guy that really knows how to do VO. Yeah. Send it to the guy that does VO. Here's the person that does coloring, yes. um, sound, and all those yeah. kind of things. And then, as I uh, said, probably in the very beginning of the podcast, the producers like can get all of that done, and they oversee everything. Yeah. So I'm I'm just trying to paint a picture for the audience that doesn't know all the spectrums of the role. Another thing I wanted to point out too is that you said the words um, uh, your position is somebody that looks to you for direction, a director, and for, uh, also that you need to execute executive producer. Ex <laughs> and it's like, oh, yes, these come <laughs> yeah, with the, title, right, with the yeah. title. Um, let, Let's start to wrap it up. Two questions I ask everybody at the end yeah. of the podcast. Um, And I think you kind of covered it. I, I normally ask, why do you do what you do? But I think you kind of covered that. So what I'll ask is, in order to get to where you're at today, if somebody was graduating college mm -hmm. and they wanted to get into sports producing mm -hmm. um which i know is a very competitive thing to do yeah what's the best piece of advice you could do um, or that you could give them sorry yeah so i think i think there's a couple things you mm -hmm. know i mean times have changed from when i was in college right um yeah. editing software is a lot more accessible shooting is a lot more accessible 
Um, I would say from a practical level, being able to edit and even shoot is really, really important. Even yeah. if your first job is going to be to log tape, to know that you know how to edit um, is already telling someone that you um, have a producer's mind. And mm -hmm. I think that's just really important because so many of the people that we bring on at kind of a junior level here, I mean, editing is like the most important thing, right? Um, even if it's just assembling sports wars, right? Taking Dan's vo and being able to just like chop up and get rid of the the ahs and the ums and the in the bad takes and that's <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. as simple as just opening premiere or audition and, and doing that but you'd be surprised how many people can't do that mm -hmm. um so i think on a practical level if if you want to get into that space and you want to be a producer at one point it just goes to speak in the language i i feel like i miss that a little bit because we were doing a different type of editing back. We were doing tape to tape editing back in the day. Now, now that's easy. I mean, it, Premiere is not, uh, or, or Avid or whatever you're using or DaVinci, like it, there is no barrier real, really to entry. I would also say no people. Um, no people. Yeah, it, yeah. It, that's hard, right? But in the same way that I was just explaining how, you know, I'm going to hire someone based on a personal recommendation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you want to be that personal recommendation. And that only happens through, you know, people that, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you don't know anybody, that's, that's not a non-starter. Um, that would go to the next thing, which is just like, try to get to know people like cold call, cold email. Um, I, I, we have to do it all the time as producers, right? I mean, when we're calling a subject that we want to sit down and interview, like we're just calling, Hey, like, I just want to talk and I need you to sit down for an interview. And you'd be surprised, you know, how most people really let their guard down. Um, you should work on being persuasive. I think that's really important mm -hmm. as well in this business. Is, oh, yeah, for a producer, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you just, sure. you really just need to, you need to get shit done. I mean, that's yeah. what a producer is, is it's just somebody who gets shit done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Produces. Yeah, Catching all the different yeah, titles. That, right that, 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 <laughs> that's really, that's it. And so I would say... You know, don't be afraid to ask people um, for help um, and don't, you know, I think I was really lucky to have some really great mentors. I was really, really lucky, um, but they put me in positions that they weren't sure I was going to succeed at, but they were not going to let me, they were going to let me fail, but they, it wasn't like a last chance type of deal. Um, so I would say, I know it's cliche to take risks and fail, but like, really, I totally remember way more of those fails than I think I do, um, you know, the, the ones that are just like successes all the time. I mean, you just, those things stick out and you have to be able to take risks because you'll learn so much more about it, but just be hungry. You know, I mean, I think yeah. there's really no other way um, to get what you want done because there's probably 20 other people that want the exact same thing you do. So you really got to get after it um, and, and be assertive, be aggressive, learn from your mistakes um, and prove that you won't make that mistake again. And that way, you know, you're constantly learning and you're going to constantly get more opportunities. Yeah, I think in terms of the knowing somebody that knows somebody comes from the being hungry. And if other people notice that you're always trying to do something and always like putting in the effort. Yeah. You can start small. And even if you don't know much about the space, if see, people see that you're putting in effort, you will get a chance at some point in time and that will snowball. I mean, yeah. what kind of chance that is at <laughs> yeah. some point, like it, it like the world works in mysterious ways and how you end totally. up in different places. And then in order to look back in hindsight at your story, you're going to kind of put the pieces together of like, Oh, I remember when I did that one thing and then it will lead to the next thing. Totally. And uh, I think it also sums up with the uh, wanting to, wanting to surround yourself with like the five best people in the room mm -hmm. and totally. in doing so. I think that, when somebody is, if you're good friends with another person that is one of those five best in the room, obviously, just like you said, if you give that recommendation, you know that, hey, I'm vying for this person and I know that they're going to want the best product yeah. or whatever that thing is. Yep. Or last question, best investment that you've had in the last year? Business, personal, whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think the podcast has been yeah. something so neat for me to dig into. I mean, I think we, we all kind of get that sense of complacency yeah, um, yeah. of, yeah, like, no, no, like I know how to tell a story. Like I got it. Like, I've, <laughs> I've done it before, but this really forced, there was a time where I remember just kind of sitting there with 
these scripts and be like, I can do this. Like, this is fine. Then I remember, you know, when I didn't know how to do it, you know, <laughs> like five minutes later, like, wow, this is like hard. Like really thinking like, no, no, like accept the fact that you don't know it right now. Like it's time to like teach yourself and learn. And, and I think that's been awesome to just keep using that part of my brain that is it. It's not just like another client doing the same thing that I've done for the last 15 years. It was something so completely unexpected um, and challenging. And so I've really enjoyed just using that part of my brain to be, to challenge myself, um, to learn something completely new, even if it on the outside, it feels like it, it might not be something all that different, but it really has been at least personally. So that that's been an investment and to, to kind of get to the point where I see things a lot quicker. Um, just, you've just, you just kind of forget about that aspect, especially when you work at a network sometimes, right? You've been working so hard. Um, you know, it's, it's real easy to kind of fall into the flow of just, well, I'm like getting to work today and I'm going to check the news a little <laughs> bit. You know, when you're out on your own, you really have to force yourself to, you know, get after it. And it's fun to be able to, to teach yourself something new and get paid for it. Um, and then who knows where that could lead. So I, I've really, really enjoyed that aspect of, not just doing the same old thing and forcing myself to teach myself something new. You know? Yeah, that's one of those things that I love about this podcast is forcing myself to because it breaches the spectrum of all different types of guests and yeah. uh, forcing myself to be like, all right, what is this person about? And then entering into a conversation with whoever that may be pushing yourself I, there was one guest I had and he had an amazing quote where you want to, he would rather like jump 10 feet and like land uh, like five feet short than just take one step. Yeah. Uh, that whole sure. thing. And yeah, totally. because of that, you keep these learning experiences. And in your line of work, you need to go and get these shots in these sometimes very scary places. So I can kind of think of that it could get complacent yeah. at times in terms of when you need to pursue something that will push yourself. It's like, who knew? Podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I really like look as, as you know, the new year comes, it's like, I want to be able to say I can do things that I'm not sure I can do. And that, that's not necessarily, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not necessarily saying that I'm lying. Like mm -hmm. I, I want to be forthright. Like Hey, th this is a challenge, but you've trusted me with X before. So like, let me try X plus Y. Like, I think I can knock it out for you and you trust me already. So I want to be able to take on roles that I'm not sure I can yet do, whether it's doing live broadcasts or, you know, doing a way bigger production than just, you know, a, um, a post-produced doc, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that that's really I think we always want to push ourselves to like get outside of our comfort zone. I, that's always excited me, whether it's walking into a Venezuelan prison <laughs> or yeah. or doing the podcast. It's just putting ourselves outside of the comfort zone. Not sure if we're going to succeed or not. But, you know, to tie it all together, it's like if you surround yourself with people, 12 people who shoot and edit and you give clear direction, like they're not going to let you fail, you mm -hmm. know, and if if you can lead that charge. Um, they're going to make you look really, really good. And that's awesome to have people like that, that, um, you know, are part of the team and, and also like have an opportunity to make you and the company look great. Yeah. And speaking of the company, uh, if somebody wanted to check out your work or anything, yep. or if they wanted to contact you, if you want people to contact yeah, you. Yeah, sure. They can go to the website, sohi.media, S-O-H-I.media, um, or hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, but my contact info is, uh, right on my website. It's my first name, your own at so dot media. Um, so yeah, the, most of our work is there. I, I don't do, uh, as great of a job as I probably should, um, upkeeping our newest of new, new content, mm -hmm. but, um, really try to get at least every couple of months, a new set of links that are up there. Our Vimeo page probably even has a couple more links. So, so high media, correct? So high media. Yep. All right. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much for taking your time yeah, to do this. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I hope the audience got a lot out of this. And if you would like to share it out, you could do so and tag me at Javier Mercedes X on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or you could just get out a piece of paper and write out the URL, send it to somebody that you love and say, hey, you should check this out. I'm going to keep saying that at the end of this podcast until somebody handwrites a, a handwritten letter and just to share out the podcast. Until next episode. I hope you're out there living a life of abundance and I'll see you guys next time.